Hey guys, and uh, welcome back to my channel. We have another VB2 bass amplifier here on the bench. Uh, this is not the same one that I've featured in my other videos. My other one is right there. This one I just picked up for $100 plus shipping to me, and it did have a lot of damage and work that had to be done to it. But let's go over what was done, and I'm also going to talk about some of the reliability issues and some of the mods you can do to make this PV even more reliable. So I'll start off with the most common problem that this amplifier has. You're playing it, everything's great, and all of a sudden, pow, no sound at all, but the tubes are still lighting up, the filaments are still active. You try to plug everything in, and you're not getting any signal out, but if you were to get your try to plug in and get a signal out of the return here, for example, then you'll get sound, but it's not coming out of your speaker. That is likely because of the internal high-voltage fuse. What happened with PV on the production of this is that they put a one and a half amp slow blow fuse for F2, in which it's this fuse down here where it would have gone. I actually put these remo removable fuse holders. The fuses actually look like this. This is what you how they look. They're a soldered in, very small, five by 15 millimeter type of uh, fuse there, and they're a real pain. To remove and replace because the entire circuit board has to be taken out all these knobs taken apart all the jacks taken out lift carefully lifted out and then desoldered from the board and they did that because it, they needed to do it for ul certification obviously we're well beyond its warranty so this is a great mod to do and 1.5 amps is too small of a value and the fix, uh, if you were to ever get this service, is to put a 1.6 amp slow blow, or you can go as high as 2 amps slow blow for the F2 high voltage fuse. That should give you enough headroom to where that fuse will not pop prematurely under normal conditions. So what I did here is I have these fuse holders. There's the F1 and F2. F1 is a 1 amp fast blow, and then F2 is a 1.6 amp slow blow, which you could go up to 2 amps if you really wanted to. I've seen a lot of guys will just, they won't elect to do this. They'll just run and drill a hole over here and put the F2 fuse right on the side there to make it easier, rather than having to slide the whole amplifier out of its chassis in order to replace it. I didn't feel like drilling it, so I put these removable uh, remote fuse holders here to make it easier also f3 your main fuse is a 10 amp fast blow the size for each of these for what i put in the nor the original ones were axial leads 5 by 15 millimeters a very weird size uh, these are 5 by 20 millimeters a little bit more standardized and then the one back here the f3 the 10 amp fast blow is a 6 millimeter by 30 millimeter typical automotive fuse those are the values, and that is how I would go and solve that problem with now I no longer have to take out the entire circuit board to change out those fuses. It makes things a hell of a lot easier. So the next thing that I just went ahead and did, because this amplifier is made from 2006, so it is going to need new filter capacitors. One was bubbled up here, it had blown its top, and the other ones all were looked fine, but when you have one that is bad you replace it with something brand new and then the rest of these are all anywhere from 16 17 years old you're inviting murphy's law i just decided to get a whole new set of nichicon with the exception of this one because i wasn't able to find a second one i forget this brand but it's a it's a good quality brand and these are the main filter caps one two three here yeah so you got one two three four five six seven eight nine 10, 11, 12, and 13, and 14. So there's a total of 14 electrolytic capacitors that deal with the power supply. I have made a DigiKey cart. Some of them are in stock. Some of them are not. Some of them are backordered. But the main goal is to get the right size footprint so that it'll fit on this board and not crowd into the other spacing of the other capacitor next to it. So just be aware of that. And then I use a little bit of neutral curing silicone to secure these all together to make sure that there's no vibration that's going to rattle them loose over time. So that is 
probably the one of the best things that you can do for an amplifier like this. It is a decent amount of work having to remove the board and to carefully remove each one of these capacitors without damaging the board. So if a technician is going to take some time to do that, but it's well worth it. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the output transformer and the what are called flyback diodes. And flyback diodes are basically put in there to protect not only the power tubes, but also the output transformer. In the event that you do not connect a speaker load or dummy load to this amplifier. And typically, if you have a shorted out power tube, which I believe is what happened with this amplifier, uh, those flyback diodes are meant to protect the output transformer and the power tubes, shorting any transient spikes to ground. And they tend to go if you have a shorted out power tube. But when I tested them, you can remove one side of the primary output transformer windings here, and then you can measure uh, a diode voltage across it. And in, if you see a diode voltage across each side, then those flyback diodes are good. Uh, but in order to replace them, you would have to remove this entire power board to get to it. And that is a little bit of work to do, but that's just another, th another thing to check for a technician if you are working on one of these amplifiers. So the next reliability topic I wanted to discuss is there are suppressor grid resistors on this power board. These tend to melt and burn depending on the type of tube that you use. For example, if you use the, uh, there's some EL34 variants out there like the E34L, it's a completely different tube, where it does not like the higher, it's a higher plate voltage in here. This has got a 550 volt plate voltage and it's about 575 unloaded. So it's pretty high. Uh, but the, if you use the E34L tube, for example, and other tubes that don't like that type of high plate voltage, the suppressor grid resistors are 10 kilo ohms here. And you can see a picture from the schematic of where these are located. Those resistors will uh, wind up drawing too much current and fail. And the best way to work around that, remove the resistors and just put a simple jumper wire to them. And that should be fine. Uh, that way they don't uh, burn out. But it's only if you're running a, that specific tube. I personally don't like anything else other than a right standard EL34 or in this case a 60A7 is my absolute favorite. But that's a, just another reliability piece that if you are going to run a different tube, just keep that in mind. Two more things that I'll mention, and they're pretty minor, but you have to just be aware of them too. In order to bias this amplifier, you need a bias probe. They do give you a bias test point, but that's really not going to tell you anything. That bias test point right below here is just going to tell you what the negative voltage uh, applied to the plates is going to show. And it's not going to show current. You need to know the current, and that's where a bias probe is going to come in handy. Also, this is your fixed bias potentiometer here. And look at where it's located. It's right next to the high voltage capacitors. Now there's really nothing around there that your finger is gonna touch that, or that may accidentally wind up touching that uh, can potentially shock you very hazardly. But I wear a rubber glove when I do this anyway. <laughs> it probably would have been a little bit better if it was placed somewhere out in the open, like right here where you had plenty of space that I can actually you know, not feel like my fingers were so close to the power caps here or somewhere that has high voltage. So just keep that in mind. Finally, the chassis has these rubber feet. And after so many years, they just, well, one, they're too small to begin with. They actually start to deform after so long. And because this amplifier weighs so much, I actually wound up going on Amazon and for like eight bucks, I got six of these things. Actually, no, I got eight of them. And they're a much thicker foot here that you can put on the chassis. They're just held in by one Phillips screw. I've already done it with my other VB2. And as you can see, it just adds that much more space underneath the amplifier. And it's more stable when it's sitting on top of your speaker stack. Well, guys, that's it. I can't think of, I think I covered everything that I had on my list on the side of me here. Uh, as far as technical issues that you might come across uh, outside of the normal maintenance points that uh, a technician, if they're working on an amplifier or any valve amplifier, will come across. And if there's any questions or anything like that, you know, feel, feel free to shoot me a comment or a message. I'd be more than happy to try and help out. I'm going to put a pin in this project for right now. 
I still need to get a nice new power valve set here that's matched and then likely some uh, preamp valves as well unless I want to keep those 5751s in there. Power valves are very expensive right now and I'm not in a position to buy them currently but I hopefully soon but when I do I will uh, send out another updated video here of me putting in the valves, biasing them and giving it a nice test to make sure everything's good to go and then most likely this amplifier will be put up for sale and if there's any questions comments anything that i miss or something that you would want to know about please let me know uh, i really appreciate all the support on the channel and thanks again guys we'll catch you on the next video